Welcome back. Rolex Monterey Motorsports Reunion. Ralph Shaheen, Bob Varsha, Mike Joy, Justin Bell with you. First of two days of live coverage from here. You won't miss any of the racing, and you'll learn about so many great cars like the one that Justin has now. Special cars. These Formula cars are why we love motorsports, well, why I got involved. The David Purley Lex Formula car, he, David actually, he was like, actually like my godfather. He had the most horrific crash in the sister yeah. car to this at Silverstone. I think it's the highest recorded survivable G by any human being. Whoop, as he runs me over. <laughs> 180 miles an hour to zero in 11 inches. And on the side of the car, just take a look at this. There's a bunny rabbit. Now, as you know, Nicky Lauda was called the rat, and I think David called him that. So Nicky called David the bunny. Now, if anyone knows anything about David Purley, there's a reason that a racing driver would be called the bunny. Anyway, brings back a lot of memories, and it's great to see the car here. This race, guys, is so fun. Look out for so many of uh, our friends out in these Formula cars, just fantastic. JPS, McLaren, uh, Marlborough sponsorship. I love it. This will be a good one. No question about it, Justin. Formula One is one of the fan favorite classes here at the Rolex Monterey Motorsports Reunion. And earlier in the weekend, my partner Ralph Shaheen had the opportunity to look at one of the most historic machine and driver combinations in Formula One history. In 1976, Colin Chapman and his Lotus crew threw everything at the drawing board they could think of. The design they came up with was the Lotus 77. This beautiful John Player special backed machine that Mario Andretti drove is owned by Chris Locke. What makes the Lotus 77 so unique? It was unique because it was adjustable in track and wheelbase. Colin thought that for different circuits it would be helpful to be able to adjust the length and the width of the car. So the front suspension and the rear suspension are all adjustable. Uh, they ended up deciding it didn't work too well and, and they uh, reconfigured the front suspension partway through the uh, season with Andretti's help and input. It was his first season, by the way, driving for Team Lotus, his first full season. And, uh, as, and they wound up uh, being successful later in the season. One other thing that's really unique, and this is in uh, Mario's biography as well as uh, other sources, they experimented with the side pods on this car during the season. They lengthened them, they tried skirts on them, and it was that experimentation with this car, changing the side pods during the 76 season that led to the ground effects car in 1977, and ultimately the world championship in 1978. Mario would put this car in victory lane, the sister car to this very chassis, at the end of the year at the Japanese Grand Prix. You would have seen that documented in the movie Rush when James Hunt beat Nicky Lauda for the championship. If you did get to see the movie, you actually saw this car in the movie with Chris Locke doing the driving. Yeah, Chris tells a great story about how director Ron Howard was on the set as they were getting ready to film and he walked over to Chris in the old Mario Andretti Lotus and said, I really like your car. I think it's going to win. And how many people know that that climactic race of the championship in 76 between James Hunt and Nicky Lauda in the pouring rain was actually won by Mario Andretti? Uh, I will. I actually got to sit in that car, Bob. Chris was very kind to allow me to do so, knowing that I was a big fan of the car and of Mario's as well. And Big fan of the car. Yes, and I can tell you that part of me actually sat in the <laughs> car not all of me as uh, mario was certainly uh smaller than i in size and chris even less in scale than mario so there's uh, maybe the majority of my right side that got into the seat and that's about it and i got out of it bob without the use of a crane yeah <laughs> you saw the american flag on the air box of that uop shadow from the pen of don nichols these F1 cars will span the range from 1967 to 1984. So much glorious Formula One history. My favorite race cars. And a lot of these cars have some wonderful stories to tell. I mean, the one Justin was talking about with the name of David Purley on the side, one of the great lost talents of British motor racing who died in the plane crash with Graham Hill coming back from a test 
He's a pretty good wheelman in this event too. Uh, Charles Nierberg, who has spent many years racing professionally, is going to be competing in here in one of the Williams. Yep, Bud Moeller does a lot of posting on the internet of his adventures and his collection of Formula One cars. Charlie Nierberg and I actually are fellow alumni of Dartmouth College. I must say, Charlie's done somewhat better in life financially <laughs> than I have. Or he'd be up here and I'd be down there, which is where Justin Bell is. Yeah, I mean, you said it, Ralph. You you managed just about to get in the car. Uh, I actually have seen a couple of generously proportioned gentlemen squeezing themselves into cars that were driven by Italians that resembled Kentucky Derby riders more than they do race drivers. So, But it's the names on the side of the car that really get me. You know, you see Hans Stuck. You see Alan Jones, I mean, Didier Peroni, Martin Brundle, Alboreto. And, and as I walk along, I think that's the, the thing that really um, impresses me because these are names that went on their own into, to win championships and part of motor racing folklore. But can you imagine what it would be like? Look, you're going past that Jean-Pierre Jarrier car now. Can you imagine what it must be like to have achieved a, a level of business success that you can actually buy into part of motorsport history and and actually be in behind the same steering wheel with your feet on the same pedals and that's the part I, I, I love the most I'm gonna jump in with Charlie now Charlie uh, obviously a little delay everyone's turned off their engines this car I mean this this takes some real driving <laughs> and I'm glad you got the stones to do it uh, you know you know what it's all about it's uh this is one of Jones's championship cars in 1980 and I've owned it for many years, raced it successfully for many years. It's like an old shoe now. An old shoe that's on your right foot because that's the fast one. But the, here he is in that tag, Saudi Goodyear. Uh, if you remember, fly Saudi down the rear wing. As you can see, as we make all the way down, you've also got the, uh, the Rothmans uh, livery you just went past on, on that Formula One car. We've just been given the three minutes to go thing. Martin Lauber, who's in the number 39, is just about to start up. I'm watching you there. Martin, this is... I'll see you later. He just started his engine, guys. Okay. Everyone's got their game face on because it doesn't matter that this is 30 years later. It still requires huge commitment to drive these, Ralph. But I'd give it a shot if I was given a chance. Well, if you were generously proportioned as you say I am, maybe you wouldn't be able to fit in the car. <laughs> we'll be back. They'll be racing here in a moment. Cars now rolling here at the Rolex Monterey Motorsports Reunion, presented by Jaguar. We are here at WeatherTech Raceway, Laguna Seca. Formula One cars now on track, warming tires and engines. A little bit earlier when they sat in the pit lane, you saw a shadow with the name Jean-Pierre Jarier on them. Back in 1976, I believe it was, Jarier and world champion James Hunt, or world champion to be, I should say, drove a pair of Don Nichols designed Shadow Formula One cars against a pair of Nichols Can-Am designs driven by Jackie Oliver and the name of the other driver escapes me right now for a $10,000 to the winner match race won by Jarier. Hunt sat on pole and the Formula One cars like that one outclassed the Can-Am machinery. We've got a lot of speedy dry. Someone must have dropped oil. I didn't see the crews out there. That is a lot of dust in the air. There's that ex Nicky Lauda Ferrari coming up the hill. Well, that explains why we were down for a while, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. well, the corner marshals must have noticed it. And as I mentioned earlier, they are eagle eyed do anything to make sure that the racers have the best opportunity to shine. Lotus, McLaren, Tyrrell, March, Shadow, Surtees, Wolf, Ferrari, Ensign. We recently lost commander of the Ensign operation. Morris Nunn had a great career in IndyCars as well. Also Alfa Romeo, Leger, Williams, all represented in this class of Formula One machinery from 1967 to 1984. Here comes another engine note, completely different, and a wide variety within the class as the revs come up and they await the green here at WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca. 
You like the sound of Cosworth DFE horsepower? There's plenty of it out there. they get up to the corkscrew and you can hear all that noise as they charged up to the highest elevation F1 at Laguna. It's a sight Bob that so many race fans dreamed of seeing Formula One at this circuit. So many thoughts and rumors over the years as they scream under the bridge for the first time. And Ferrar Azza and his Liget leads the field at this point. Mateo out front. De Silva's shadow, Tillens, Tyrrell, Shippard in the Brabham, and Nierberg in the Williams rounding out the top five. Ferrarazza just checking out here. It's a 79 Leger, certainly not the newest car in the field. Look at that UOP shadow. Such a spectacular looking machine. Every one of the vehicles that came out of that design group, whether it was the Can Am car, the F5000, which we'll see a little bit later on in the weekend, or certainly the F1 machinery, just tremendous. Wow, what a beast to handle as you see it sliding as it comes out of rain. Richard Da Silva from Manhattan Beach, California. This particular car was the most successful Shadow F1 car, driven by Jean-Pierre Jarrier to third place at the Monaco Grand Prix in 1973. Bob, you know, you mentioned Trevor Harris earlier, his involvement with the Nissan group. If I'm not mistaken, Trevor was also involved with the Shadow organization early on in his design career. Oh, dipping a wheel there. You gotta be careful as you come out of four. Mike Cantillion in the number 34, 1980 Tyrrell. Didn't cost him the position as he's able to gather it back up before they got to five. And now that inside line going to six. Nope, not gonna make it. Gonna tuck wisely in behind. It's a very tempting corner as you come up to six. Tremendous feeling of weightlessness as you drop down into the course group. Oh boy, that shadow is dancing all over the racetrack, Bob. The size discrepancy between the front and rear wheels. A lot of push at the back. In replay. De Silva. Get the left side wheel off, and then as they go side by side, turn five looming. Back course, to live action. The big American flag in the top of the airbox because Shadow Team was an American racing organization, but the F1 program was based in Britain. It was ever thus in Formula One. Yes. Other than Ferrari, the successful Formula One teams have traditionally been based in the United Kingdom. Because of that, they were uh, the first constructor to officially change its nationality. The only F1 victory for Shadow Racing Cars, 1977, 
the Austrian Grand Prix was achieved as a British team. Unmistakable design influences. The F5000 car will actually look very similar with that high arching airbox when you see that category a little later on. What's going on here? Battle for 15th place, Doug Mockett, 78 Wolf WR6. And the 15 of Bill Cord, 76 March, 761. The car. Uh, that Cord is driving was driven by Ronnie Peterson and Hans Stuck. It's a pretty good lineage, I would say. Doug Mock and a big supporter of the Team USA program to advance the careers of the most talented young American drivers. Journalist Jeremy Shaw has headed that project for a couple of decades now. Credit to Doug Mockett for being one of the supporters of sending young American racers over to try their hand at Formula Ford racing against the best young drivers from Europe. Gentlemanly driving went right out the window when these guys buckled in. Let's have some fun. These two squabbling over 15th. Becoming a fairly heated argument, too. Cord cutting inside here at the final corner. Gonna force him offline. He had to slow it down too much, and it didn't work out. That is aggressive stuff, I have to say. Close by is the red white number eight, Sean Allen, in a 1980 McLaren M30. Looks like he has a black James Hunt style helmet livery. Charlie Nierberg. Nierberg is an interesting story. Lives in Texas. Successful oil man and holder of a land speed record that he set in a streamliner called the Spirit of Rhett, named for his son, Rhett Nierberg, who was lost to cancer at a very young age. That so, bothered Charlie for a long time, but he takes it out in his racing. Side Meeker in his Tyrrell taking the position away from the 97. I saw Charlie uh, in the paddock area earlier today, proudly sporting his club record holder hat from Bonneville today. Of course, uh, they were just busy over on the salt last few weeks. Yeah, there's been a lot of activity out yeah. there. Word coming from those that were there that it was some of the best salt they've had in years. As many, including Danny Thompson, establishing records uh, out there, well over 450 miles an hour. Yeah, I was so happy for Danny Thompson trying to to fulfill his father's dream. Going, and I mean, he shattered the old record for a piston-powered race car. His one pass at 450 miles an hour. Broke the record by, gosh, like 30 or 40 miles an hour, as I recall. Challenger 2. Yep. There's some onboard footage on the internet that will take your breath away when that car starts moving offline. A little bottled up here in 11. Pretty 
pretty good battle here in this uh, portion of the field, Bob. Speeds uh, just up around 150 miles an hour as they come up over the bridge. That's the start. bridge. The track is now 2.238 miles around. It was once basically a large circle before this bit. This infield section was added to meet the international governing body, the FIA requirements for world championship level four and two wheeled racing. So they put this infield section, turns three, four, and five. But other than that, you used to get down to what is now the Andretti hairpin and go straight on with a wall of dirt to your right and just never lift as you swept across the valley. And it connected back up there in turn five. Rejoined it right there, yep. Well, there's Chris Locke in the uh, Lotus 77. Of course, it was a couple of years later that Mario ended up winning the world championship in a Lotus 79. Uh, you know, Justin, when I squeezed myself down in that car, I noticed the view out the front, as you see Chris running the Andretti colors on his helmet. And the view, you felt so exposed inside these cars, Justin. The front end just completely goes away. You have no view of the front wing. All you see are those two big wheels, one on each side of you going around. I think that's the best part about driving these cars is how in touch with the dynamics you are. I'm standing out here on the bit wall, and those drivers are, are literally, as you say, in touch with the tarmac in every way. And there's zero lag between the direction of the front wheels and what goes through your hands. It's just fantastic. But Ralph, I mean, you seem to have had such an extraordinary experience in the car. Can I ask on behalf of the fans how fast you were going? <laughs> I was just sitting in the paddock area, Justin. But it felt like so 200 well miles knew. an hour. Yeah. Oh, oh <laughs> had, I'm sorry. But listen, oh. had Chris been willing to have them fire it up, I would have gone at an idol around this racetrack and grinned all the way had they just given me the opportunity. But I, oh, we uh -oh. got one around Spinner here. Spinner in 11. Yep. And that's a bad place to block the racetrack. <laughs> Okay, there's room to get around. And there comes McAllister in his Ferrari. That looks like Bill Ford in the March that Peterson and Stuck drove. Yeah, he was well up the field at one point. It's all gone away. That's a good idea. Coast it backward. Good move. See if they can get out of the way if they're going to have to throw a yellow to properly yeah, clear him. No onboard starters in these cars. They had to be started externally. So that's probably the end of the day for Mr. Cord. Uh, they're going to consider that a safe spot and he can exit or not. I think it is. Ferraza has been having it all his own way. So, Bob, as all the fans tuning in know, you're one of the most respected and most loved F1 announcers in the history of American television. Uh -huh. What was, and I can say that as your buddy, what was your favorite car of oh. all the F1 machinery? Oh, oh, oh. Um, I'd have to say that the prettiest one was the uh, the early Jordan 4, I believe it was the uh, E91, the Coca, the seven up car. Yes. Beautiful in green, Gary Anderson design, very simple, very swoopy, just a gorgeous car. Uh, after that, maybe the uh, FW13, the all singing and dancing active suspension car. Um, Gosh, what else? So you tend to like the more modern era machinery than the older stuff? Well, ahead of the the really old machinery, yeah, and, and then certainly not the more recent stuff where aerodynamics have taken over and the cars were all angular and, and boxy looking. I don't think anybody would pick one of those. No, I don't think so either. I'd think about that for a little bit. I mean, take this for example. Functional, but lovely, I don't think is the word you'd use. But that Jordan, I thought, was really spectacular. 
Of course, every fast race car is a beautiful race That's car. That's right. If it's in victory lane, it is the most stunning thing you'd ever seen at the time, right? If you remember the team. Mm -hmm. Well, I tend to be drawn to a lot of the red ones, like that one right there. Well, that is a good one, to be sure. However, I must tell you that, that uh, John Player Lotus, yep. of just about every generation, whether yeah. it was an Emerson Fittipaldi car, or Mario Andretti car, yeah. I thought the John Player special machinery was just gorgeous in that livery. Well, that was a great livery, you know. <laughs> that would have looked nice on just about anything, yes. I'd have to say. The Lotus uh, 79 that Mario drove to the championship was a was a pretty car, I thought. Yep. 1978 and a 79, right? Like we showed the 76 car was, a nine, was the Lotus 77, and it was just yep. different how they did the... Uh, cleared cord from the inside of 11 there. Justin, sounds like things are getting active down there in the pit lane for you. Oh, yeah. that. That's what I've got to say. If only I was as eloquent as those beautiful Formula One engines. And that's what's really in touch with everyone here. I was walking up and down the pit lane and just seeing the joy on the fans' faces because these engines, look at that JPS Lotus go by. That DMV sound, that is what literally resonates in your skin. And I, I really want, I was joking, Ralph, when I said you didn't, you didn't drive. I knew you hadn't driven. <laughs> but I have driven one of these. I drove a Williams. And I've got to say, the visceral nature of it, no electronics. It was literally, there was no fly-by-wire. This is the way race cars were. And I think it really is, that one isn't that. It's not the ideal racing line, just so you know. Um, but... For me, it was when racing was just so in touch for the drivers and so in tune. So it's these guys are having to work for it, by the way. I mean, there's no play in that steering, and, and this racetrack is terribly physical. So, but I'll still stick by it. These cars and the ones that are group that are coming next there. That's the uh, that's the ticket I'm going to try to get for next year. Sadly, Justin, one of the most beautiful sounding machines here all weekend is this Ferrari of McAllister's. That is coasting down the hill with smoke pouring out of that gorgeous V12 engine. And that's a Nicky Lauda car too, a 312. Yeah, I'm thinking, I mean, the engine's in the rear, radiators in the front. Chris McAllister may be getting a, a hot foot right now. But you saw him get his arm in the air, warning traffic behind that he was slowing down. And everybody managed to avoid him. Hopefully left no fluid on the tracks. Excuse right. Me, Good luck getting the needed parts from your local Ferrari dealer for that one, right? Justin, we didn't have a chance to ask you. Obviously, you grew up in the heart of Formula One. What was the machine that got your heart racing as you think back through the eras of Formula One? Well, the, the model that I had the most of was the JPS Lotus. It was the gold and with the black. And when you think about it, how appalling that was, I was a two and three year old who was battling with my sister's I also tobacco sponsored car because she liked the Marlboro cars. So there may be a reason why we no longer have tobacco companies involved in motorsport because kids like me were just fascinated as we watched the Gitans car come by. Yes. But, you know, thank goodness for Formula One companies because we really wouldn't have had some of the world's best racing without it. No. Working the final lap here. And you can see the speeds as they charge up the hill. Well, it has been some tight racing here. Final lap diving inside. Boy, not afraid to risk it at all, are they? <laughs> no, they are not. Oh, don't touch wheels, boys. De Silva looking for the duck under move. Oops, and now he pulls to the side of the road in that shadow. And Shippard in the Brabham BT44 there, the white car, 1974 machine, which is an air I always enjoyed with big air boxes up top like that, the huge rear wheels. Oh, oh boy. Big off there. Yeah, that's Cal Meeker and his Tyrrell, 79. 
can delivery machine. Stay in the car. Well, okay. Wait for the marshals to tell you to get out. Yeah. I thought of another car that I should have mentioned when it came to my favorite, most beautiful Formula One cars. 67 Gurney Eagle Westlake. Oh, yes. 67 Spa winner. Here comes a checkered flag. Boy, not a moment too soon after that lap. They lost two cars. Taking the victory here this afternoon. So many race fans who dreamed of seeing Formula One here at WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca were able to do it of at least this variety here today. And we will all hold out hope that maybe someday. Look at the aerodynamics on that car. I will tell you someday. that there's the name of my favorite Formula One driver, or I should say my favorite Formula One driver name, Jacques Lafitte. What better name for a racing driver? So everybody are out of the cars, everyone accounted for. We'll wait for the cleanup and return in a moment.